You know, there's a, there's a thin line between foolishness and, and, and fearless. Anyway, we'll get to that at some point. You know, one of the things that I love about Mavuno and I love about this church is our, our mission statement. And our mission statement says, turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. That's our mission as Mavuno. You know, and if you're hearing this for the very first time, please just take a note of that because you'll hear a lot of this, especially as we go into this series. Turning ordinary people into fearless influencers of society. But what does it really mean for us to be fearless? You know, we have talked about that word so many times that some of us really don't know what it means. You know, uh, fearless, fearless, fearless. We, wrote, we, we throw this word around, uh, but we don't really understand what it means in the context of God's mission. You know, throughout this month, we want to learn from a group of people who, for me, exemplify this word fearless. You know, ordinary men with very few or, or little in the way of wealth or education. They didn't really have anything going uh, for them, but they lived uh, out their lives fearlessly. And as a result... They transformed the world in their generation like no one else had done before. And few have even matched what these guys have done ever since. And the beauty about this group is that they were as ordinary as it can get. You know, men who struggled on one hand with, with their desires, uh, uh, with the desire for their needs to be met. You know, they, they, they were the place where they were like, you know what, God, you, want, you need to come through for us. But then on the other hand, it's as if there was this competition about the things that, that, that God wanted them to do. You know, it's as if God was asking them to live for greater things than where they were at that particular point. And this is, this is almost similar to where we are in life, you know. Most of us are the place where we know uh, uh, and, and we are always asking God, our prayers are about God, I really need you to come through for me, I need you to meet my needs. But then on the other hand, Somehow we have an idea of this great thing that God is calling us to do, but then it's as if there's a competition, there's that tension. But what I love about this group is that even in the midst of that tension, these guys were able to live fearlessly, and as a result, we are living today uh, 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 in the fruit of the, the great, their great fearless influence. Who am I talking about? None other than Jesus' followers, famously known as the disciples. And we're going to be learning uh, from these guys throughout this month. Their fearless story is captured well in the book of uh, Acts, in fact, at the beginning. And, and Acts, the book of Acts, uh, this is the fifth book in the, in the New Testament, is the origin story about how the church got started. It is actually a sequel or, uh, or part two of a two-book series that was written, uh, scholars say it was written by a doctor by the name of Luke. Now, Luke was not one of uh, uh, Jesus' disciples, but he walked uh, uh, through this journey with Paul and um, some of the other disciples. And, and the book of Acts was addressed to Theophilus, uh, uh, who may have been a wealthy patron. In fact, you are making an assumption. We're not very sure. He might have been a wealthy patron who funded some of Luke's journey. You know, and, and Luke begins with, with the very, he, he introduces us into Acts with the very last conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples. You know, a, a conversation that is going to change their lives forever. They don't even know at this moment, but this conversation changed their lives forever. And my hope is that even as we're listening to this, that it will change ours also. Acts chapter 1 from verse 1. And I will read, and as always, I always have to read and explain. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Now, here Luke is addressing Theophilus, as I said, and, and the thing is that he's referring to his other book, which is the Gospel of Luke, and you'll find it uh, amongst the four Gospels. And he begins the book of Acts with what happened after Jesus had resurrected. This is what his, uh, the conversation is about. In verse 3, he says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them, watch this, over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting because many of us thought that uh, or think that, you know, Jesus resurrected uh, uh, and then he appeared uh, to the disciples and then he ascended to heaven. But I like what uh, Luke points us here, it, and it's to the fact that Jesus' resurrection was not just a rumor. It wasn't that, oh, someone saw someone who looked like Jesus and then they went ahead to say, you know, I actually think that Jesus, I have seen someone like Jesus and he has resurrected. No, what he's trying to tell us here, he spoke to the disciples who were eyewitnesses of what happened to Jesus before his crucifixion, when he was crucified, and 40 days after he resurrected. So in other words, he's saying that Jesus' resurrection was not just a rumor, it was a fact, and there were eyewitnesses to that. And that's why we live by that uh, uh, belief right now. And on, in verse 4, he says, on one occasion, 
while he was eating with them, he gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, John the Baptist, baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Let's pause there. For many years, for many years, the Jewish people had been waiting for God to send a Messiah or a king who will deliver them from the Roman uh, colonization, you know, and reestablish the dignity of the nation of Israel. And, and for many years, they had prayed and they had waited upon the day that God is going to send someone who will come and reestablish that kind of kingdom. And the disciples were no different because they are amongst the, Jew, the Jewish people. Now that Jesus had died and he had been buried and then spectacularly risen, I'm sure for them, they were at that place where they were thinking. They were excited because they felt like this is it. It is time that our enemies have been defeated. It, what Jesus talked about, we were not very sure about that. But now that it has happened, this must be it. And that's why they're asking him in verse 6, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And they're thinking all our suffering is about to end. It's our time to sit in power because Jesus has resurrected. Now, maybe even in their minds, they were thinking, you know what, Jesus, we know we haven't been that great. I know we failed many times. You know, uh, 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 you know we even ran from you uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane when they were trying to capture you. Uh, I know we've done those things. You know, we have fought amongst ourselves. We have failed. We've made some mistakes. But, but hey, we are here now. That's, that's what matters. So, 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 so are we in? Is this our time as the disciples? Is this our time as the Jewish people to reign over the Roman Empire? But I love what Jesus says in verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, Jesus is telling them, This is above your pay grade. It is none of your business when I will choose to do what I will do. That's what he's saying. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has, sent, has set by his own authority. He's not saying he won't do it. He's not saying, no, 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 I'm going to do that, whatever you guys are asking for. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, that's not where I want your focus to be. And then he uses a word that suggests to them, I, I see where you're going with this line of thought. I see, I see how you guys are thinking. But, he uses that word, but, this is where your focus should be. In other words, let me tell you what your business is going forward, what you should be concerning yourself with. And it's this, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I want us to pause there because this, this really forms the basis of our conversation for the next couple of weeks. From a human perspective, and walk with me here, from a human perspective, the disciples were not ready to be left with such a Herculean responsibility. They were not. It seems like Jesus was making a huge mistake here, and I'm hoping that I can, I can unfold that for us uh, at this point. If there, was, if there was anything that might have made Jesus sound ridiculous, it is this conversation. Let me, let me help you understand. He's standing there with a group of very ordinary people. In fact, most of them were peasants, you know, who had absolutely no influence. They had no credential. In fact, they had so many human frailties. They had so many limitations that these guys had no ability to be able to launch into this worldwide movement. And Jesus talking to this bunch of unqualified people, he says to them, yep, you guys, you guys that I'm talking to, you guys who are unqualified, you guys who have deserted me, you've ran away from me, you guys are the ones I want to work with to start a movement. These ordinary guys, a movement that will represent me, and it's not just going to impact Jerusalem, no. It's not even just going to impact the capital, the capital city uh, 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 that is Jerusalem. It's not just going to impact even the nation of Judea or, or, or the neighboring nation, Samaria, where Jew, Jew, Jewish people don't like go, to go to. What you're about to start is going to impact the most remote part of this earth. If, if we didn't even know how the story ends, if we didn't know how this story connects to where we are right now and who we are today, we'd probably think that Jesus was out of his mind. After all, this was a group that constantly failed during their three-year training. Let me, ex let, me, let me give you some examples. There are so many examples. Peter, who was their natural leader, this guy, he tried to walk on water. And he drowned. Hashtag, 
trying to be Jesus. He drowned. There's these guys, you know, he then disowned Jesus uh, uh, publicly. And, and, and in fact, not once, thrice, he denied Jesus publicly. And he said he doesn't even know, he lied that he doesn't even know Jesus. Hashtag it wasn't me that you guys saw. Then, then they, they, they go ahead, James and John, who are, who are some of the closest disciples of Jesus. They hatched a political scheme to, 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 to shut out the other disciples so that they can form this Jesus kitchen cabinet. Hashtag big fail. Can you see how these guys were? And then, as a group of, as, as many of them, they tried, they tried to cast out a demon from a young boy, but they all failed miserably. Hashtag that awkward moment. And then, if it is, if to make matters worse, when Jesus is being arrested, they all ran away, they scattered, exited, hashtag Brexit. And a few weeks later, <laughs> and a few weeks after that, Jesus, after, after Jesus was arrested, a few weeks after that, he stands before them, he calls them together, and he tells them, you, you guys, you who, who denied me three times, you who ran away when, when, when I needed you guys the most, you guys who did not even believe me at times, you guys who, in fact, after I, I, I was crucified, you went back to your own businesses, you guys, you ordinary people, will receive power. These same disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I dare ask Jesus, are you serious? Are these the guys that you want to leave uh, your legacy with? Are these the guys that you believe will start a movement that is going to uh, uh, traverse into the whole world? Uh, a movement that will represent even the God of the universe across this world? Yes. And, and Jesus speaking to the disciples and speaking to us today, it's as if he's saying, inside each one of us is the potential for a world-changing movement. Jesus speaking to the disciples, looking at their past failures, looking at their present thinking. They are still thinking about the Israel, the, 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 the kingdom of Israel, the, the, their, their nation. They are, still, they are not thinking about the greater kingdom, the eternal life that Jesus has been talking about, the kingdom of God that he has been talking about. He knows their present thinking. He still looks at them and he tells them, you will receive power. And you guys have the potential to have a world-changing movement. You are God's plan to transform those around you. Jesus speaking to his disciples and speaking to us today, and I'm, I'm hoping the many things that I'm going to say on this stage, the one thing that I want you to walk away with, the one thing that I don't want you to forget is this, that you are God's plan to transform those around you. The world might have judged those men as inconsequential or as ordinary, but Jesus saw men who will fearlessly change the world for him. That's what he saw. And true to his word, thousands of here, years later, here we are. Today, we are standing, meeting in a city of a country that they didn't even know existed. All they knew at that time was the Roman Empire. That's all they knew. But thousands of years later, we are here and we are discussing, we are talking about that very moment, that very conversation that we were having with Jesus that time. Because this man lived a fearless life. And if you're sitting here and you're wondering how Christianity has spread across the world, well, I'm hoping that this conversation is pointing you to the right direction because it all began with that conversation with Jesus and his disciples. And thousands of years later, the disciples have spread out across this world. This gives me hope to know that God can still use me. That if Jesus stood there, he looked at Peter, he looked at James, he looked at John, he looked at Andrew, and he saw all their weaknesses. He saw how they had messed up. I mean, they had walked with him for three years, and they were still at the place where they were still doubting whether it's, 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 it's true that he is the son of God. Looking at them, he still said to them, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. It gives me hope. Because up to date, I still sometimes question God, and I'm like, God, why did you choose me to lead such a community? I mean, I have made mistakes in my life. I've had great failures in my life. But this gives me hope and it guarantees me. And I'm hoping that it's giving someone hope here because it assures me that it is not by my strength. Because remember, remember what Jesus said first. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, then you'll be my witnesses. 
Because it reminds me it's not about me and about my strength. It's about the fact that God has called me to be his witness across the world. And this is the prophecy that, that led us to start Mavuno Church 11 years ago. You know, we had a passion to, to be witnesses and reach people who are far from God. And our desire was to help these such people uh, to connect with God, uh, help them to connect with their God-given purpose, and also help them to connect with a community like this, a faith community like this. And I believe that God has greatly answered that prayer. In fact, let me just ask by a show of hand, how many of us here can say, truly, my faith has been awakened, or I have found Christ in this place, or I've received healing, uh, uh, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, I've received that, that kind of blessing and, 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 and just a, a praise report from God in the past few years that you've been in Mavuno. How many of us can say that? Wow. Glory to God. Glory to God for what he has done in this place. You know, this is part of what it means to be fearless. And, and, and to be fearless, it, it means that we need to constantly grow. We need to constantly grow to become like Jesus. You know, this is the duty of every follower of Jesus. You are God's plan to transform those around you. That's the reason why you are here. That's the reason why God is going to entrust you with power. And that's our primary role as his followers, to testify that Jesus is alive and show that what he has done for our lives. And ultimately, that we can help others encounter him. And we, as we ourselves have encountered him, all the power that God gives us, all the blessings that God has showered on you, they are not just to be used for you. It's there to be used for you to be witnesses to your neighbors, you know, uh, 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 to, to, to even to this city, to the region, and ultimately even to the whole world. He wants us to impact others for him. That is what our focus, that is what we anchor uh, everything that we do here at Mavuno on. That, that for the next 10 years, we are, we are looking at the place of where we need to be witnesses of God across this world. Not just in Nairobi, not just in Kenya, not just in Africa, but across this world. Everything that we do here as a church is anchored on this, on the fact that we need to be witnesses of God across the world. When we plant churches, our vision is to plant culture-defining churches in every capital city of Africa and the gateway cities of the world by 2035. The reason why we're planting churches is because of this. And you know the one thing that I love about this is because this is God's business. This is what God has been doing over the past thousands of years. And, and I would rather be caught up in doing God's business than being somewhere, somewhere else. But the greatest danger that we face is that our Christianity easily turns inwards. Let me explain. It becomes self-serving. It becomes about God meeting our needs. You know, uh, uh, it becomes about moving from one breakthrough to the next. My career, my business, you know, my prosperity, my spouse, my family, my health. It becomes about me, myself, and I. You know, the easiest tendency for Christians is to become consumer Christians. And you come here every Sunday and, and, and you get fed. Let's meet again next Sunday. Or let's meet in our life group meeting. And you get fed and you continue. And, and that's the danger that we face. You know, and it doesn't help that the prosperity gospel that is preached by many even in this city is one of the most visible representations of, of what Christianity is to our culture today. And is often most about what God can do for me. You know, what, what, what can I do so that God can bless me? How can God distinguish me from the rest and make me look good? When is my breakthrough coming? Lord, is this the time? Lord, is this the time that you're going to establish me as the leader in that organization? Is this the time that you're going to bless me with a spouse? And we, 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 we put all our focus on these uh, prayers for ourselves. And whereas those prayers are important, whereas those conversations with God are important, that is not what God calls us to be. He's calling you and I to be his witnesses, to show and tell who he has been and continues to be to us. That's our primary responsibility as Christ's followers. One of the biggest problems or chronic problems that we face in Kenya is corruption. And, and, and Transparency International defines corruption as abuse of, of entrusted power uh, uh, for, for selfish gain or for private gain. Now, we all know the grand corruption, you know, where, where high-level government officers, you know, they, 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 they use their power uh, or their influence, you know, to, to, to loot state coffers. Uh, we also know petty corruption, you know, where, where officers and, and citizens, uh, they take advantage of their positions uh, so that they can be able to benefit themselves. But I wonder to myself, whether there's a third type of corruption, one that uh, Christians who will criticize the first two, grand and petty corruption, are guilty of. 
And that is spiritual corruption. And this is how I define spiritual corruption. Using God's power for private gain and not for the intended purpose. To be fearless is to grow, to become more like Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But he made himself nothing. Jesus Christ, knowing very well that he had the power, he could have taken the advantage of the fact that he was in very nature God. But he chose not to. And in his humility, he made himself nothing. He died for you and I on the cross. He lived for you and I his entire life. Who are you living for? Who have you impacted in your life? Let me ask, what percentage of your prayers go to praying for others to receive Christ or to start this faith journey or even to come to church? What percentage of your prayers go to those people who haven't found Jesus yet or they're struggling with this walk with Jesus? What percentage of your prayers go to that? And what percentage of our prayers goes to God? I need you to bless me with this, that, and the other. I need you to give me a job. I'm not saying that that's not wrong. I need you to bless me with a spouse. I need you to bless me with this. I need you to bless me with that. I need you to bless me. I need you to protect me. I need you to me. What percentage of your prayers go to others? And what percentage of your prayers go to yourself? I think I've said this in one of our forums, that if at this very moment, at the snap of my fingers, if God decided to answer your prayers in that one snap like that, the only person who will be blessed, unfortunately, is you. If all the prayers that you've made in the, in the past even, let me even say in the past one year, if God decided at this very moment, at the snap of Kevin's finger, I will answer all your prayers. It is unfortunate that for some of us who are here, the only person who will be blessed will be you. And yet God says, you as my follower, you are to be my witness in Nairobi, in Kenya, in Africa, and to the ends of the earth. Because you are God's plan to transform those around you. The things that God is calling us to do cannot be achieved by human strength. That is why we need to every day be fully dependent on the on Holy Spirit and just be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The thing that God is calling, the things that God is calling us to do cannot be achieved by experts alone. That's why we need each and every one of you. Because God has placed something in your life. You have a gift, you have something that can be used for the advancement of God's kingdom. And you know, even that's why we did the refresh challenge at the beginning of the year, because we, we were seeking to be refreshed, and God has truly refreshed us as a community. But he wasn't refreshing us so that we can look, be comfortable and then start all over again. No, he was refreshing us because he, there's, a, there's a purpose for that. There's a purpose for why he was refreshing us. So that we can begin to understand what our role in this community is, what our role in this world is. So how do ordinary people like us with so many issues even begin? Let me, let me, share, let me, share, let me give you two pictures. Okay, The first picture is, is of a fire. Now, some of you might have read about this fire in, in Canada, Fort McMurray. Uh, and, and there's a huge forest fire that began on May 1st. Now, you might have read about it in the news, but uh, to date, to date, it has destroyed more than 1.5 million acres of land. Um, now, 1.5 million acres, uh, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. But probably Machakos is the closest, you know, and, and Machakos not just the city, but Machakos the county. 
Uh, I mean, it's vast in its region. I think it goes down up to one day. I, I stand corrected here. Um, but, but think about that. You can go and Google uh, and just see wh how, how big 1.5 million acres is. Including 2,400 homes. Over 80,000 people. Over 80,000 people have been evacuated. It has taken, watch this, at the end of May, it had taken 1,200 firefighters. And during that time, uh, 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 they were hoping to add an extra 1,000 firefighters. They were using 55 helicopters. They were doing this for the past two months just to control the fire. Now, right at this moment, they are saying that they are taking, they've taken control of the fire, uh, or at least they, it's in control. But the fire has not died down. It probably will take an extra few months. In fact, they are saying, in fact, some reporters were saying that it might take even up to a year for that fire to die down. It's only that right now they've, they, in a, they in a, it's in a state where it can be controlled and it will not spread uh, rapidly. But here's the interesting thing. Do you know that it all began with a spark? That fire that has caused all that havoc just began with a spark. And in that little spark, there's the full potential for a massive inferno. The second picture, I don't even know whether we have it, but it's, it's, it's of a forest. You know, forests don't begin as forest. You know, you, you see seeds grow into trees and then trees grow into forest. Every forest began as a seed. You know, and, and every seed contains within its DNA the potential to become a forest. Why am I sharing this? You see, when Jesus looked at his disciples, he could see their past failures and he could see their present thinking. He could see where they were. He could see all their limitations in life. But I love the fact that he could also see their potential. And the potential that he saw in them is that inside each and every one of them was the potential of a world-changing movement. Inside each and every one of us is the potential of a world-changing movement. Jesus says to his followers that he will give them the power to be witnesses, beginning where they are to the ends of the earth. This means that it is within our DNA, your DNA, to go out and make disciples. Beginning with where you are, where has God positioned you? You are not there by chance or by coincidence. Whether it's at home, whether it's at work, you're not even in school. And God is saying, do not misuse the power that I give you. Don't just be a comfortable consumer Christian. Yes, I know your needs are important. That's my business. I'm giving you power because I want you to do great things, because I'm going to take care of you. I know there are times that I, I don't fit in your timetable, but you, it's not about me fitting in your timetable, it's you fitting in my timetable. So there are things that you've prayed for and they haven't come through, but that's my business, because you're my son and my daughter, and I will come through for you when the right time comes. You are God's plan to transform those around you. God has entrusted you with power within so that you can start a world-changing movement. You know, I love how this story ends. You read the book of Acts and you see the group, this group of inadequate, fearful, self-serving disciples who are just selfish, and they transform into this fearless army that changes the world. And why do I say that? By the time they are done, their little spark has, has started a fire that has spread across much of the Roman Empire into the different continents. A couple of thousand years later, here we are in a city called Nairobi that they didn't even know existed when they were starting this uh, uh, movement. And we are here celebrating. And several billions across this world, in every continent of this planet, who have encountered Jesus because of those ordinary people who began that conversation with Jesus. Ordinary people, businessmen, housewives, artisans, government officials, all these people, each doing their little part and then allowing God to do his. As I conclude, are there people around you? Your family members, your neighbors, your work colleagues that haven't encountered God, haven't experienced him the way you have, well, guess what? You and I are God's plan to transform those people. I love what uh, Caleb said last week. He said that God doesn't have a plan B with you. No, you are the plan. You are the plan. 